And when did you see Mr. Ariola next? I slept in. He showed up around, I don't know what time exactly it was, 1.30 or 2 o'clock, and he pulled into the property in his truck. And where were you when he pulled in? I was in my fifth wheel trailer. I stepped outside when I saw him pull up. And what did you do? I just went to greet him, and uh, we, we, we greeted each other just outside the gate where my fifth wheel RV was parked. Did you notice anything about his demeanor at that point? It was definitely a little bit different than the other times I had met up with him. He was kind of short with me, and um, he kind of had a scowl above his eyes. He um, he seemed to be in a bad mood is what I thought. He, he just wasn't in a good mood or something. So after you greeted him, what happened? Um, he went over to his trailer. I went back into my fifth wheel, and... Um, he was moving stuff from inside the from his truck to inside the trailer. He had brought a bunch of gro a bunch of groceries, and was moving stuff into the trailer. So what did you do at that time? So I wanted to have a conversation with him about the purchase of the property, and um, I was thinking things were falling through, but I really wanted to communicate with him to see if we could work a deal. And so I went over to the trailer and went on inside, and he was in the kitchen unloading groceries. And what happened when you went inside the kitchen? I started talking to him about the trailer and about getting someone to look at the agreement. And he was kind of standoffish more than I'd ever seen him. Um, he's behaving differently for sure. And we started talking about it and it started getting kind of heated. Um, so I, I could tell that our conversation wasn't getting much better at the time. So I wasn't sure what to do, but um, I was just trying to communicate. And how long were you talking to him for? Probably about 10 minutes, uh, eight minutes to 10 minutes. And when you were speaking with him, did he appear intoxicated? He kind of did. Um, I didn't get very close to him. I couldn't smell anything at the time, but uh, he, definitely, he definitely seemed intoxicated a little bit. I wasn't sure if he had been drinking or been smoking some weed or something. And we've heard testimony in this trial that Mr. Ariola was on cocaine at the time of his death. Were you aware that he used cocaine? No, he never shared that with me. He never uh, told me that he used cocaine or tried to share it with me when we were drinking. Okay. And so you're having this conversation and it starts to get heated. What happened next? So he gets a pretty bad scowl above his eyes. You could tell he was getting pissed off. And um, I was getting... I was getting a little anxious too myself. I just really wanted to get get the deal done and get the contract looked at by an attorney. Um, I started calling him out. I was calling him out saying, look, are you trying to scam me on this deal or what's your problem? I kind of maybe went one step too far. To I didn't realize how angry this guy could be or how he could get that way. When you say that you may have gone one step too far, what do you mean? I called him a scammer. Um, and that really blew him off, off the top. That really made him angry. And after you called him a scammer, what did he do? Um, I said, are you scamming me? And he uh, runs across the kitchen. He was only three or four feet away from me at the time. He comes running at me. He has something in his right hand. And he comes at me. He swings at it. I block with my left hand. And he barrels into me with his, um, his left hand, kind of like a, like a blocker at a football game. It pushed me against the countertop. And I slid off into the hallway. I was on my, on my hands and feet. I'm going to stop you there for a minute, slow you down. Okay. And I'm going to show you what's already been admitted into evidence as State's Exhibit 44. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photo? I do. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the kitchen with the, the start of the hallway. You can see the hallway going off to the left there. And can you... Tell us where you were standing when Mr. Ariola attacked you. I was standing right there. I think that's where my feet were. My feet, my feet were. And when he knocked into you, when he attacked you, where did you go? I fell backward. I landed about where the sunglasses are. And then he was all over me. Um, but my rifle was sitting right next to the wall there, um, right about there. And I, as he was on top of me, he was trying to swing with the canister or something in his hand. 
And uh, I reached across with my right hand across my legs and grabbed the rifle. And then I was uh, scooching backward down the hallway, trying to get back up to my feet. And I'm going to stop you there for a okay. minute. So when he tackles you or attacks you in the kitchen, I think you used the word attacked. When he attacks you and you fall to the floor, were you wearing sunglasses? I wasn't. Whose sunglasses are those? They were on his hat. They were uh, Glermo sunglasses. Okay. Do you know how they got on the floor? I think when he came over me, swinging above me, they fell off. So he's swinging at you with a canister? Yeah, I, I know there was a canister at that time. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was a knife or what he had. Did he ever make contact with you? He never did. I kept blocking him with my left hand. And so after you're on the floor, what happened next? I was doing a crab walk kind of thing, trying to get my feet under me. I got back up to my feet or almost back up to my feet. And he came running down the hallway and hit me again. I fell into the very entrance of a small bathroom. I was kind of in the door jam with my, my legs were in the hallway, but my upper body was in the door jam of the bathroom. Um, he was all over me at this point. He's swinging as hard as you could swing. I'm blocking him as much as I can. I've got the rifle by the barrel, and he's trying to grab the barrel and trying to grab the rifle out of my hand. I knew I couldn't let go of that thing for the life of me. Um, I ended up fighting myself back to my feet. I backed up down the hallway. I was about four or five feet from him, and he's just in a rage. He just and starts. Let me uh, stop you there. Okay. When you are knocked down the second time, you scramble to get back up, you said? Yeah. And what do you do then? I get it back in the hallway, and I get back about five feet from him. I'm about at the very end of the hallway at this point. I finally grab the rifle, like you should, with the handle on, with, with one hand on the handle and another hand on the barrel, which is kind of got a plastic coating around the barrel so it doesn't burn your hand. And I said, stop. And uh, he didn't stop at all. He came charging at me and knocked me into the back bedroom. When you screamed, stop, and you have the rifle, what are you doing with the rifle? I'm trying to protect myself. I'm basically thinking that if I point this at him, he's going to stop coming at me and realize how serious it was. But he didn't. He just came barreling into me. He, he was coming into me like a, like a football blocker, coming with his left hand and his other hand up in the air with, the, with some object in his hand. So after you yell stop and he barrels into you again, what happens? I fall back in the back bedroom. And um, my legs were all the way in the bedroom, um, kind of by that heater where you had showed that heater before. Let me pull it up for you. I'll show you State Exhibit 61 again. So is, where were you? Does this photo show where you fell? Yeah, kind of. I would say my uh, legs were where the uh, number four is, and my upper body was just out, just outside of this photograph. I was scrambling out from underneath him. He was all over me. He was on top of me, swinging with that thing in his hand, and I was crab walking back again, trying to get my feet back under me. This time, he was all over me, though. He was leaning over me and swinging violently with uh, something in his hand. I'm going to show you a different photo that might help us a little bit in understanding okay. what you're describing. Um, Permission to approach the witness, Your Honor? Yeah, that's, that shows a lot more for sure. That definitely show where I fell. Do you recognize what's depicted in this photo? I do. Is this a fair and accurate representation of this part of the room? It definitely shows the entrance of the bedroom. At this point, we would move for the admission of Defendant's Exhibit R. No objection. He'll be admitted. Permission to publish? You may. So, Mr. Cummings, in this photo, what are we looking at? We're looking at the entrance, uh, the door entrance to the back bedroom and a propane heater. And I don't know how we clear the yellow markings that we had previously made. Put your lower left hand on, the, on, on your screen. Not the, over here Do on I the just hit clear here? Oh. There. Thank you. So this is the doorway to the bedroom? It is. And what is it in that lower corner? 
That's the propane heater. What is this metal bar? That's uh, where you hang the heater on. And so as you're falling into the bedroom, tell me what's happening. He's just all over me. He's totally in a rage. Um, I fall backward into the back bedroom. I start scrambling and trying to get out from underneath him as best I could. I had the rifle in one hand. I had it by the handle at this point because I had picked it up and put it in my hands properly when I was in the, when I got out of the ba bathroom. And um, I'm scrambling right now trying to get away from him and he's, he's swinging as fast, as hard as he can with his right hand. And I'm using my left hand and I'm using the, my elbow and my palm of my hand with the gun in my hand, pushing off, trying to s slide myself back out from underneath him. And I don't know, one of us hit that heater. I don't know if it was me or if it was him. And when you hit the, and one of you hit the heater, did it come off the wall? I, uh, it was too crazy. Um, I didn't, I didn't really pay attention to that part of it, but it looks like it did. Fair enough. I'm going to show you again what's been already admitted as State's Exhibit 46. Mr. Cummings, do you see in this photo a green area rug? I do, a throw rug. The throw rug, yes. Where was that throw rug before this fight started? It was spread out evenly on the floor, basically where you'd be sitting on that bunk bed with your feet on the, on the carpet. It was laid out on the floor. It wasn't underneath the tote. It was on uh, further to this side of the tote, the rubber made container. How did the rug get all pushed up like that? I think I was on top of it. I think uh, part of my body was on top of it. And when I was doing the crab walk, trying to get out from underneath him, I think I pushed it up. So as you're crab walking or pushing back, what is he doing? He's swinging at my head with that, can with that canister. He even glanced me a couple times. It was like he was trying to rub it on me or something. But I got a hold of his, I had a hold of his jacket and I was blocking him with my left hand. And who had the gun? Um, I did. And where was the gun? It was in my right hand. And I was using my right hand to walk, try to crab walk away from him and trying to get my feet underneath me and blocking him with my left hand. And was Mr. Ariola touching the gun? He was all over it. He was trying to get it out of my hand. He was pulling on it. And I was hanging on to it with, for dear life. I didn't want him to get that gun. I knew it was a, would have been the end of me if he got a hold of that gun. And so you say that you knew it would have been the end of you. What is going through your mind while you're fighting over the gun in this bedroom? I just couldn't believe he was this crazy that he would attack me like he did. And I was definitely seriously worried about my life at this time. I knew if he got a hold of that gun that uh, it would have been the end of me or if he would have nailed me in the temple with that, with that canister in his hand. Um, I started thinking about my family and my kids and I said to myself, you're not going to be a father much longer if you don't get serious about what's going on here, Dean. I was basically talking to myself, trying to get, get, um, get to the point where I could start pulling a trigger. And so what happens when you have that thought? Um, I'm still trying to get up. I think I got up to just uh, about um, in a squat position, and he's all over me. He's got a hold of the gun. I couldn't get it up, and um, he's pushing on the ground. I think he pulled the gun against my fingers is what happened, is why the first couple shots went off. Um, once the shots went off, I got my left hand, I took it away from his right hand. And, and I, I want to stop you and I want to talk about those first couple shots. Okay. We've heard evidence and we've seen photos of some impact sites with scorch marks. Yep. Those two impact sites on the floor. Yeah, I saw those. Do you know how those happened? He had a hold of the gun, pushing it down so I couldn't pick it up. And the gun went off. Um, I thought it went off more than two times, but it turns out it was just two times where it shot the floor. I'm pretty sure the barrel was touching the floor when those two shots fired. And after the gun goes off those two times, what happens? I just say to myself, Dean, you got to get serious about this. If you're going to be a father any, any longer, I just started, I grabbed the gun with my left hand. I tried picking it up and he had his hand. He was fighting over my, over me with his, his hands all over that gun, trying to yank it out of my arms. And I just started pulling the trigger and um, 
I must have been just a quarter of the way up, not even that, maybe a, um, a quarter to a third of the way up because all the bullets went through the wall at a horizontal plane. Um, I never really did get that gun up. Okay, so when you, when you pulled the trigger, you're saying you're about a third of the way up? Yeah, I think he was all over me with his right hand. I'd given up on his right hand so I could grab the rifle properly. Mm -hmm. And I just started pulling the trigger. And um, I didn't think we shot that many times, but that gun went off a lot of times. And um, what happened when the gun goes off? Um, once the gun went off, um, I knew, I had, the gun went from, from being down low to going up higher. And um, he falls at my feet just right where I was, right where I was at trying to get up on my feet. Did Mr. Ariola say anything to you during this fight? At the beginning, he said, I'm going to kill you. That's the first thing he said to me when I fell down in the hallway from the kitchen. Did you believe him? I believed him. He was, he was in a rage. <clears throat> After the gun goes off and Mr. Ariola falls to the floor, what do you do? I get up to him, I get up all the way and I walk outside and I was choking on something. So I was coughing, I was doing a technique that you do for high mountain, uh, mountaineering, where you, and you get, you clear your lungs, you get anything that's in your lungs to come out. And I was, went out, I walked outside through the little mud room, he had a little porch there and I walked outside and I was kneeling over, um, trying to hack that stuff out of my lungs because I could feel it was, that my lungs were kind of seized up a bit. Did you know why your lungs were seizing up? I didn't. I didn't realize uh, that he had anything like mace, um, but I was coughing. And um, I looked over there, and my, my face felt really cold, and it was stinging a bit on my face. So I ended up looking over, and there was a water spigot over there to the back of the trailer. I went over there, started splashing water on me. It didn't seem to help much, so I actually went back inside. And I looked in to see if, if that guy was still moving or not. He wasn't, and I noticed a canister in his hand, and that's when I was uh, concerned it might have been a chemical of some kind. I went into the, to the kitchen. I got some soap in my hand, in the palm of my hand. I went back outside. I took my shirt off, and I started washing myself um, on the side of my head, washed, it, washed my hair, washed the side of my skin. And then I dried myself up with the towel, with the T-shirt, so my, the T-shirt got all wet, and I was worried the T-shirt had some sort of chemical on it as well. How long did it take for you to uh, recover from the effects of the spray? My skin was stinging quite a while, and I seemed to be able to clear out my lungs. I just kept coughing and doing that technique that you do for high mountain elevation mountaineering, and I got that out of my lungs, but... Uh, it kind of burned for a while um, at that point. I went over to my trailer and I grabbed a shirt. I took the shirt off, I threw it on the bed of my truck, and then I put a new shirt on. It was still chilly, it was winter time. And what did you do with the gun? I put it on the front step, I, I cleared, I took out the clip, I cleared the, the barrel so it wouldn't be around in the barrel. I knew the police were going to be coming. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't a hazardous situation for them and that I wanted them to be able to trust me that they were safe by going into that building. Um, I'm going I, to show you what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 27. Mm -hmm. Is that where you put your firearm? That is. I set it right there on the step. And did you remove the magazine? I did. I took out the clip and I cleared the magazine out of the barrel. And you did that, you said, because you wanted it to be a safe scene? Yeah, I wanted the police officer to be able to see it so they knew where the weapon was so they could go in and check out the scene. Um, I was just trying to make it as easy as I could for them, and I was definitely kind of worried about what could happen next, so I wanted to make sure they didn't think I was armed. Now let's talk about this firearm for a minute. What type of firearm is this? It's a 5.56 Sig um, and Sauer. And why did you buy it? I bought it when uh, they were gonna. They were supposed to be gonna outlaw ARs. I bought it to uh, as an investment. I bought. I bought two of them. I bought a Colt and I bought a Sig and Sauer. I was gonna sell them in Alaska. You can sell guns on a thing called Alaska List. So I was gonna just try and double my money on these weapons. And why did you have it out 
this at this time? I was going to go Barbary sheep hunting. Uh, New Mexico has a Barbary sheep hunt that's year round over the counter. And there's Barbary sheep out there by the Kimazon Peaks and out there by Largo Canyon. So I was going to go hunting and see if I could find one of those uh, Barbary sheep. So why was the rifle out in the first place? I had put a new scope on it. And when I mounted it, it wasn't uh, quite right. It wasn't level. So when you look through it, um, you could see that the crosshairs were off angle. So that night I readjusted the scope and made it all level. And that's why I had it there on the table and it's leaned up against the wall. We've seen evidence that there was some electrical tape around the scope. Uh-huh. Why was there electrical tape? I put lens covers on the scope so if it rains, the scope doesn't get wet when you're hunting and or dust. And they just cover it up really good. And it, it was not the tightest fit. So I got some electrical tape and I stretched out the electrical tape and wrapped it around there. It's really secure stuff once you stretch it tight. It's kind of a technique electrician, electricians use to put over wiring and stuff like that. Was the cap to the scope still on when you came outside after the shooting? I didn't really notice. I was in shock. I wasn't really paying attention to any of that. I was just so worried about getting that stuff off my face and off my, off my hair. Um, I didn't pay attention to that. So backing up a little bit, do you know approximately what time of day it was when this attack occurred? It was around 3 o'clock, maybe 3.30. And you said that it took you a little bit of time to clear your lungs and the, st the stinging to stop? Yeah, I, um, my lungs were stinging for quite a while, and my skin was stinging for quite a while, too. I, I, uh, I washed myself really good. I washed my hands. I washed my face. I washed my hair. I put on a clean T-shirt. And it probably lingered on my body for about an hour. I noticed it was still stinging, and... Um, and my lungs cleared out pretty quickly because I had coughed, just coughed it out um, probably 40 minutes, and then my lungs felt normal again. And when you started to feel better, what did you do at that point? I went over to my truck, and, um, well, I did a couple things. I put the gun back on the back. I put it by the porch on the front, the front, front porch there where they could see it. I went to my truck. Right when I got to my truck, I saw a motorcycle going down the road, so I ran over to the edge of the property by the gate, and I was waving, trying to wave this guy down, whoever was on that motorcycle. And obviously, he didn't see me. He didn't come. He didn't pull in. He was a good quarter mile away, but I thought, that since it's so remote, he would see me, one person flagging their hands back and forth. And then when he didn't come see me, I went back to my truck. I got in my truck and I drove to an area that's about four miles away where you can get cell phone service. Um, I one time, once, Guillermo showed me one time with his four-wheeler, we drove up there so he could call his father. Um, so I knew where the cell phone service worked from, from that trip we made. So to be clear, was your cell phone working at the ranch? No, no cell phone works at the ranch. When you were seeking cell phone service, why? Because I wanted to call 911. And as you're driving out there to get cell phone service, what happens? I'm driving along. I'm looking at my phone to see if I'm getting any bars. I drove all the way up to an area called Camazon Peak. There's like an interest, interest sign there that the BLM put up. It talks about the, all the volcanoes and how they were created. And as I pulled up, there was a man over there reading the sign. And I pulled up and wanted to converse with him. I wasn't sure if he was friends with Guillermo or who he was. So I started a conversation with him. And you said you weren't sure if he was friends with Guillermo. Why were you concerned about that? I was just concerned. I wanted somebody to be a witness, and I wanted to have somebody with me uh, when I went back to the property. I was definitely in shock. I was kind of scared and in shock. My hands were still shaking. Um, I was definitely nervous. I was now kind of concerned about the police showing up with guns. I figured it'd be a good idea to have somebody out there with me. And so what did you do next? Um, we, we talked, and he said he had cell phone service. And um, he, he asked me what my phone number was and what my name was. I gave it to him. And then he walked behind the back of my truck and was talking to 911. 
I thought he was giving him my license plate number, but I'm not sure if he did or not. And then right about the time he was on a conversation on the phone, I had three bars pop up on my phone, so I called 911 as well. I wanted to tell them as much as I could. I knew they'd have a hard time finding the place, so I wanted to tell them where it was. I got 911, I called and I let them know what my name was, what my phone number was, and that what had occurred and tried to give them directions to where I was at. After you spoke with 911, did you call anybody else? I called my dad. Why did you call your dad? Because I was just nervous and scared. Um, I knew when the police were going to show up, there was going to be guns out, and I didn't want to get shot. Um, I was just, I just felt like I needed to have some people there with me because I was so scared and in shock. So what did you do next to try to ensure your safety? I took, I took David down to the ranch with me. Um, he followed me on his motorcycle. We took him down to the ranch. I wanted him to be witness of everything and to be there with me. Um, he uh, walked into the building, he took a look at what was going on, and he exited the building. And instead of staying there with me, he jumped on his motorcycle and took off, which was kind of nerve-wracking. I was hoping he would stay there with me. Um, so I, I climbed back in my truck, and I sat in my truck for a good, for a long time. Um, I waited around for the police. It seemed like it took about two and a half hours before they arrived. It was daylight when, uh, when the incident occurred. It was daylight when I met with David. And when he went into the trailer to look at the scene, the scene, and um, by the time uh, it must have been around 6:30, 6:50, maybe, um, I decided I better drive back up to the to the property. It seemed like two hours or, or more had gone by, so I ended up driving back up to the Camazon Peak Trail, so I could uh, call 911 again or see what was going on. And uh, I jumped in my truck. I drove out of the property. I got maybe 100 yards out of the property, and I saw three cop cars parked at the top of this road. It was an entrance road to the property. They were about a quarter of a mile away from the property. They had parked there, and they weren't sure what to do, I think. So, so when you started to leave the ranch, did you know they were down there? I didn't. I thought, that I thought they'd be up at Camazon, or they just hadn't arrived yet. Are there any other roads that, lead, that go away from that ranch, or is that the No, only it's road? a one-way. So when you see the officers, what do you do? When I see the officers, I put my truck in park. I roll down my window to see if they're yelling anything or telling me what to do. Um, and sure enough, they were. And I turned the engine off because my truck's a diesel, so it's hard to hear anybody. And as soon as I put my head out the window, I heard them say, get out of the truck, put your hands up, and approach us. Um, walk toward us with your hands up. And so did you follow their orders? I did. I just walked up there with my hands above my head. I had about, I don't know, it was a good 100 yards away from them. So I walked up the road. I knew they were pointing guns at me, so I was definitely nerve-wracking. So I just made sure I kept my hands up no matter what. And did you try to follow all of their orders? I did follow their orders, yeah. I could hear them, and I was definitely concerned about them having guns, so I followed their direction perfectly. How were you feeling when you were walking towards the police? I was scared. Um, I was still in shock from the incident. My hands were still shaking. Um, I was nerve-wracked. I was, I was devastated. I couldn't believe what had just happened and that I was involved with it. Do you recall ever being asked by any of the officers what your name was? I don't. I don't think they ever asked my name. I had given my name already to 911, so I figured they had it. Um, I heard the testimony of that officer. He claims he asked me my name, but the whole time I sat in the back of the truck, he sat over there in front of his vehicle. He never really came over to converse with me. I don't remember him ever asking my name. So what you're talking about now when you were sitting in the back of a truck, are you talking about your truck or a police a, officer? A police car. They had uh, Dodge Ram trucks uh, with, with uh, sirens and markings, the sheriff's department. Did you ever give any of the officers the wrong date of birth? I don't think so. I know my date of birth. That's not possible. Did you ever attempt to conceal your identity from the police? I didn't. I'm not sure where that came from. Did um, you ever attempt to hide or destroy evidence? No, not at all. I told them exactly where my shirt was and where my coats were. I let them know exactly why I put them there and where they were.